The same thing we celebrate in, in the boxing ring or mixed martial arts octagon, we villainize on the football field. We pretend that 70% of men who participate in tackle football past high school are at risk of developing dementia by age 60. It's media-induced madness, similar to the fear mainstream media fomented around the COVID flu. The real pandemic is fear. We're being programmed to fear of football. DeMarie Smith is football's Dr. Anthony Fauci. ESPN is CNN. The NFL's concussion protocol is the N95 mask. Who campaigned for the NFL to immediately adjust its concussion protocol after Tua Tungviola uh, suffered head trauma or a spinal injury on Thursday night football against the Bengals? DeMarie Smith and the NFL PA. Welcome, welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Uh, happy Tuesday. Uh, welcome back to the show. We're moving into the heart of the week. And man, do we have a fantastic show planned for you today. Uh, in studio, TJ Moe and Delano Squires uh, via Skype, Steve Kim. We're going to talk some more about the National Football League. Uh, an interesting uh, in a, uh, Monday night football game last night between the Chiefs and the Raiders. Uh, we saw the feminization of football continue to play out in that game, and it kind of reintroduced a topic we, we covered a bit yesterday. I got a whole new take on it today and who we should really blame. Uh, we'll get into that. Uh, Delano has written a very fascinating column about uh, black Christians and how we have a choice to, to make. Are we gonna choose a Christian identity or a black identity? We'll talk about that as well. Fantastic show plan for you. Let me take care of a little business so we can clear the deck and dive into this conversation. I wanna tell you guys about my good friends and our good friends at Good Ranchers. You know I tell you guys, fearless soldiers, you need to be feeling, uh, feeding your soldiers Good Ranchers meat. Let me do it again, let me explain to you why. They got this October feast going on, and, and we're trying to invite you to uh, take a different outlook on Halloween, and don't get that dressed up costume meat, don't fall for the gimmicks of the grocery store, and go ahead and get you some real good ranchers, homegrown American meat, none of that spooky bacteria, none of that processed stuff from overseas, and think about this, you get two pounds of their Wagyu ground beef and two and a half pounds of their better than organic chicken for free with any purchase of one of their bundle boxes. So again, forget the Halloween tricks and treats, head over to goodranchers.com fearless to claim your special October feast offer today. Store-bought meat has all that stuff that you really don't wanna be bothered with, Plus, right now it's you know pretty frightening inflated prices going on. Good Ranchers lets you save $25 on every box you lock in, and the price you lock in is set for the life of your subscription. It's set for life. You can take out all the worry of these rising prices. Just head over to goodranchers.com fearless to get over four free pounds of high quality beef and chicken. The real monster isn't hiding under your bed. It's in your local grocery store. Take control over your food with an October feast from Good Ranchers, American Meat Delivered. All right, now that we've got that out of the way, we can get down to business and talk about why you're here for the show today. Uh, we have a fantastic topic, a fantastic fire starter, and then we'll get to TJ, Delano, and Steve Kim to fan these flames I'm about to start. So let's get it rolling. Quit blaming the referees for ruining the NFL. Take Jerome Bolger and Carl Jeffers out of your crosshairs. The lead officials flagging defensive linemen for roughing the passer are soldiers following orders handed down from on high. The players, current and former, are responsible for undermining the integrity of NFL competition and feminizing the game. 
The players chose DeMarie Smith, a beta male with a subversive agenda, to lead their union. The players swallowed the anti-Gene Upshaw narrative and decided the NFLPA needed an executive director with no connection to or passion for football. They prioritized leadership that would be adversarial with ownership, aligned with progressive politics, and willing to rage a race war with an industry that produces more black male millionaires than any other. Useful idiots elected a Trojan horse to lead them. Player safety defined Smith's 13-year leadership platform. Like all Marxist ideas, Smith's platform uses the skin of truth to hide the meat of a lie. Sorry for stealing that votey, but I had to. He paves the road to hell with alleged good intentions. He wants to make football safer. It's a virtuous goal, but it has its limits. It's the equivalent of making carrot cake less fattening. You remove the frosting, brown sugar, flour, cream cheese, and butter, and before you know it, you're closer to making coleslaw than cake. The enemies of masculinity hate football and its perch atop American popular culture. They're waging a long war to turn football into soccer, a sport played at a high level by men and women. Smith serves that agenda. A DC lawyer, Smith is the antithesis of his predecessor, Upshaw, a Hall of Fame NFL player who innately understood the essence of football. The game sells gladiator-style violence to an audience that loves high-risk competition. Upshaw fought for players to earn as much money as possible in exchange for taking the physical risk. He was not unconcerned with the health of players. He simply understood the league's TV partners sell cake, not coleslaw. So who led the overreaction to Tua Tungviola's concussion? DeMarie Smith and the NFLPA. Smith called for a full investigation of how the Miami Dolphins handled Tua's injury in the game against the Buffalo Bills. Tua left that game with either a back injury or head trauma and returned to finish it. Throughout the history of professional and amateur football, players have returned to games after suffering an injury millions of times. It's not remotely uncommon. Over the last decade, as corporate media have used CTE junk science to undermine football participation, every time a football player gets his bell rung, it's treated as a possible life and death situation. The same thing we celebrate in boxing or mixed martial arts, we villainize on the football field. We pretend that 70% of men who participated in tackle football past high school are at risk of developing dementia by age 60. It's media-induced madness, similar to the fear mainstream media fomented around the COVID flu. The real pandemic is fear. We're being programmed to fear football. DeMarie Smith is football's Dr. Anthony Fauci. ESPN is CNN. The NFL's concussion protocol is the N95 mask. Who campaigned for the NFL to immediately adjust its concussion protocol after Tua suffered head trauma or a spinal injury on Thursday night football against the Bengals? Marie Smith and the NFLPA. So who is ultimately responsible for referees Jerome Bolger and Carl Jeffers flagging Grady Jar Jarrett and Chris Jones for roughing the passer on routine harmless football plays? Smith and the NFLPA. They caused the hysteria that is rapidly changing the game of football. Troy Aikman complained on Monday Night Football that he was tired of the way the NFL was being officiated. He demanded that the league's competition committee take the dresses off the players. Take a listen for yourself. Here's a call again, or the play again. The ball comes out right there. And the ball is possessed by Jones. He's going to the ground with Carr. His body's there. It's just where it, it is. It's too much. I mean, my hope is the competition committee looks at this in the next set of meetings and, you know, we take the dresses off. All right. After watching that same sack strip of Derek Carr, Tony Dungy tweeted, this is not football anymore. 
I know we have to protect the quarterback, but Chris Jones was recovering a fumble. We have gotten ridiculous with this. Aikman as a player and Dungey as a coach are both enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Aikman suffered multiple concussions during his playing career. Dungey led defenses that feature concussion giving hitters like John Lynch, Derek Brooks, and Warren Sapp. Football is not meant to be a safe space. Removing the hard hits and wrapping the quarterbacks in bubble wrap undermines the integrity of the game. So do all the limits on practice time and practice contact. The game that Troy Aikman played isn't the same one that 45-year-old Tom Brady now dominates. The current game devalues Brady's accomplishments. We're turning Babe Ruth into mighty Mike Mancinko. You ever heard of Mancinko? He's the home run king of softball. He cracked more than 6,000 homers. He's not Babe Ruth. The NFL is fast pitch softball with a bunch of guys getting Barry Bonds money. This construct fuels a justifiable and unhealthy resentment among retired players. The old guys who actually built the league into a TV powerhouse sit at home nursing their wounds and watching Kyler Murray earn $46 million a season for playing a game they don't respect or recognize. You don't have to be Dick Buckus' age to harbor that resentment. If you played in the NFL 15 or 10 years ago, you have a right to be frustrated. The frustration manifests itself in peculiar ways. The former players aren't mad at DeMarie Smith or the union. They blame the people who the media instruct them to blame. Ownership. It's Jerry Jones's fault. It's Dan Snyder's fault. It's the billionaire owners. It's the white man's fault. He's their daddy. That's not true. This is on the players. They're poor stewards of a game that enriched them. The players followed Colin Kaepernick into the anti-American abyss. The players followed the Alphabet Mafia into the Black Lives Matter abyss. The players denigrate football, the industry that has produced more black millionaires than hip hop or even the NBA. The players won't defend the game that has been very good to them. They're so controlled by bitterness and envy and social media, they'd rather tear down the NFL than leave the league intact for the next generation. Many of the former players want the NFL to fail. They made their money. They want the ratings to drop and for fans to walk away. They naively and foolishly believe it will hurt the billionaire owners who have a plethora of revenue streams. They don't care that it will deprive the next generation of players from acquiring the life-changing and generational wealth that benefited the former players. The intentional mishandling of the player safety issue is just another version of the long-form okey-doke black liberals find irresistible. Dee Marie Smith is football's Lyndon Johnson. Player safety is the Great Society Initiative. The concussion protocol is welfare. And all the beta males chirping on ESPN are welfare queens. That's my fire. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Delano and TJ and Steve Kim into the conversation. Before I do that, I want to take care of just a tiny bit uh, more business uh, so that we can just fall off into this conversation and forget about all the business. Uh, so guys, uh, hate going to the doctor. I know I do. It literally takes half a day just to get it done. Also, there are certain issues you don't really want to talk to your doctor about. Here's the thing. Most men's health issues have really simple solutions. Rex MD, it's all about simple solutions. RexMD makes getting generic and branded Viagra or Cialis easy. Everything's online, even the prescription, and they deliver to your door. No office visits, no talking to a receptionist. Super simple. Just fill out a quick medical questionnaire on their website. A doctor will review your situation and prescribe it to you, if appropriate. It's fast, simple, and cheap. You can access your U.S. licensed RexMD physician anytime you need afterwards. Starter packs of generic Viagra or Cialis are now available for our viewers. 
but you've got to go to rexmd.com slash fearless to get started. Go to rexmd.com slash fearless today to get started with a starter pack prescription of generic Viagra or Cialis. All orders come with free two-day shipping. RexMD, the authority in men's telehealth. People thought I was going to struggle with that, but I'm so transparent, I could care less. You got a problem, take care of it. Don't be ashamed, but you can do it in private. RexMD. Go there, be a good little fearless soldier. Your wife will be real happy with you. <laughs> do it. I got one day, I'll be right there with you. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's bring Steve Kim uh, into the conversation. I always, I, I like to start uh, with our visitors over Skype. Steve, I think we've got this all backwards. We're blaming the refs for a problem that the NFLPA and the current players are actually driving. Do you agree? Uh, partially. Do, do I believe the referees are virtue signaling based on the last dozen or so years and specifically the Tua situation? I don't think there's any doubt about it. But look, the referees in this case, they got to have better football savvy. At the end of the day, they're the ones making the calls. And particularly that Chris Jones uh, play, which I thought was interesting. I've never seen a, a sack strip be called a quarterback or roughing the passer. And so now we've delved into the situation where you want to protect the quarterbacks who are the hope diamond of the National Football League. They do really run that association that you've made them untouchable to a point. It's a penalty where if you hit the quarterback too hard, Jason, I don't know if you noticed this, but the first two sacks of the game, the defenders made it a point not to bring the quarterbacks to the ground. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, it's already started. But as the guys got lathered up, as they started to play the game of football, they started tackling. And just the hypocrisy um, is striking to me. This is where I do blame the referees. If you're going to make that the new standard, that you a quarterback cannot hit the ground like they're wearing a red jersey in practice, make it across the board because in the second quarter, Denzel Perriman flung Mahomes to the ground and everyone held their breath. And it's like, oh. There's no penalty. And, and I think that's where the referees do bear some of the blame. Think about this. If the Chris Jones play goes unflagged, nobody would have said a thing. I still think, to me, they're the last barrier to making football football. And to me, that's not even a borderline play. So I disagree. I think the referees do bear some responsibility. You use the word some, S-O-M-E. And so give me a percentage then. If you had a choice between blaming the NFL, the referees, or the actual players in their association, those three groups, break me down on a percentage basis who you blame. I'd go 60% the administration, which is the upper, upper offices, the DeMore Smiths of the world, Roger Goodell. And I'd go 20% to the referees, and I'd go 20% to the players, although... Uh, and I sent you guys a bunch of tweets. I'm glad that the workforce, because they're important. I'm glad that the current players are now speaking out, saying, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, we didn't sign up for this. We know what we got into. Let us play the doggone game the way it's supposed to, because without them actually speaking out, nothing will change. I hope last night is some sort of marking point where at least we get back to some sanity into this whole process. Uh, Steve's only putting 60% of the blame on the administration or the guys in suits and the Players Association. I, I, I'm going to go 95%. Uh, <laughs> TJ? 100. These are full-time <laughs> employees. We had a, they tried a program. They started this in 2019. That's oh, like, you're blaming the refs 100%. No, no, no. no, no oh. Zero. 100% on the administration. Oh, okay. These referees are a bunch of uh, uh, part-time employees that don't even get benefits. That's the people we're going to blame for ruining the NFL. It's like these, these guys barely get a 401k match. I'm, just, I'm reading about it as yeah. we're sitting here. So it's like they may throw a flag knowing that everybody up top is saying, okay, good, you did what we told you to do. But the referees, I mean, some of these guys got social media and whatever, and 
and especially like the Dean Blandinos and Mike Pereira, they get crushed over social media when they make these type of calls. Nobody wants to be talking about this, the good officials. And if you're in the NFL, typically you're a pretty good official, don't want anybody to know your name. You want to stay out of the way as much as possible, and you became a referee because you loved the game. And so 0%, this is 100%. I don't even blame the NFLPA like you do. I, I blame 100% the idiots running the NFL who have caved to the woke idiots and said, sure, we'll wreck the sport. You for enough don't money blame the NFLPA even though we got to have an investigation. Tua got hurt and returned to the game. Yeah. We've never seen that in the NFL. Yeah. That's unbelievable. We must yeah. investigate. <laughs> Bring in the FBI. Let's raid Mar-a-Lago. You don't blame the NFLPA at all. It's all on Goodell. There, the NFLPA has always been full of idiots, right? They, most, and, and the NFL players <laughs> in general, these are a bunch of guys who don't know business. They don't know anything except for what's right in front of them. Everybody, th you know, everybody has their brand now, and they think business is, I'm popular, give me money. That's yeah. the extent of what they know about business. So the NFL, do you reason Smith doesn't know anything about business? He's in the business of manipulation. And so the guys who know business, the 32 billionaires who are up there should say, kick rocks. We've built the greatest business that's ever existed, again, to build more black millionaires than have ever existed. And so some people are going to get hurt in this violent sport. We'll handle it as best we can. Delano, I know you're not the expert here, but you can be the arbitrator. So uh, uh, one thing that, that hasn't come up in the conversation that I think is worth raising is the potential that this was just a bad call. All of us who watch sports. Series right? of bad calls now. S series, but, but the, the fact that um, it wasn't called the other way on, on, on the Mahomes sack would, would make me question, okay, did the refs just get it, get it wrong? And I think people are starting to say, you know, um, roughing calls should be reviewable under instant replay. If we see a pattern of this moving forward, then I think it's fair to say, okay, I definitely think that part of it has to be the NFLPA. They, they, they say we're looking out for the players, we're looking out for player safety. These guys are not just, not just cogs in a machine. These are real people with real lives and real families, so we want to do everything to protect them. I, I, I think that's the NFLPA's position. Mm -hmm. But there's another part of it, which is you know, the league itself and, and upper upper echelon, Goodell, and, and you know, sort of central administration. I, I think it's worth um, sort of disentangling some of these, these issues, because I know we, we, you, you, Jason, in the column, grouped a lot of them together, right? I'm, I'm just curious to, to know what would be, um, I guess, the, the impetus for the NFL to want to ruin its own game. Um, I see why they would want to make the NFL gay because they say, oh, wow, look, there's 15 gay guys who like football, so we can appeal to them. But part of me is just, I keep going back to the same thing. Why would these guys want to kill the golden goose? But, and, and, my, my, and maybe I didn't go in depth here, but it's a part of my overall narrative for 10 years mm -hmm. that the game's under attack by the left. True. And... If you go back, Joe Lockhart. Joe Lockhart was a Clinton political operative who got, a, who got installed as basically the head of media relations in the NFL. And it was his job. He was the Trojan horse within the NFL offices. And it was his, he, he, he led how the NFL handled Colin Kaepernick in 2016. Mm. And it was all an inside job, a plant, the, the NFL mishandled Colin Kaepernick, and on the uh, player side of the players' union, D. Murray Smith is not a football person. D. Murray Smith is a five foot six, uh, tiny human being <laughs> that was a D.C. lawyer, right. tied up in the D.C. Democratic political operative game and all of that. He, the players, foolishly got baited into. The, uh, smearing, the smearing of Gene Upshaw yeah. for years that went on. Brian Gumbel, everybody, he's a sellout, he's this, that, that. And it was all to create this belief that, hey, you shouldn't be represented by a former player. Mm. You need to be represented by someone who understands politics and can operate at this level. And so they got a political operator running who does not care one bit about football players. Not one bit. Football players were 
uh, pulling his underwear up and giving him a wedgie, <laughs> throwing him inside <laughs> locker rooms when he was growing up. He, hates he don't care about football players. Yeah. They got someone now. So he's a puppet. Wow. And that's why they're playing 17 <clears throat> games right now. And that's why, again, and, he, and his whole brand is player safety. Mm. That's, so his legacy is, play, it ain't like, I'm going to get you guys the most money I can for playing this high-risk sport, and I'm going to make sure you're taken care of post your career. It's player safety. His whole, DeMarie, and player safety is an issue that the left knows football can't win. Yeah. It's almost like, Say, can this seat that I'm sitting on, can it win a fight with my rear end? No, it cannot. It's an impossibility where I'm at right now. As a safety right. in football, you can't win. Let, let's prioritize safety well, in boxing. Let's prioritize <laughs> abstinence in marriage. Mm. You ain't gonna win with too many men uh, or women. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's the priority. I'm gonna make abstinence the priority in marriage. Right. It's all a long play to compromise football, and it's working. The whole everybody's focused on safety. They're, they're not focused on enjoyment, competition. Yeah. Everybody's watching. Oh my God! I hope no one gets hurt. Bring, that's like bringing that mentality to a fight. But 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 you did say in your column that Gene Upshaw did care about player safety. Yeah, and and you think there are ways to make the game safer without turning it from cake to coleslaw. So my question would be, if Jason Whitlock was We've the We've passed all those steps. They've done all they can. Yep. So, okay, so you think they've taken it as far as they can with the game in terms Too of safety? Too far, actually. Because, okay. again, people want to see the quarterback knocked on his rear end. True. When I go to a boxing match, I want to see somebody hit the ground. Yep. Deontay Wilder. Tyson Fury, somebody's got to go down for me to, I want to do what Joe Rogan and Daniel Cormier <laughs> yeah, yeah. did when, <laughs> you know, yeah. when somebody gets knocked out. That, that, that's part of the joy of football. Mm -hmm. It's Jason. built into the game. Go ahead, Steve. Speaking of boxing, long time ago, uh, someone told me that I was in the sport for years, made their living in the industry of boxing. They said, Steve, you want to make boxing safe? And I said, well, of course. Yeah, how? And he goes, ban it. It's the only way. So we have to live with this sport the way it is. And the actual participants, and I've known thousands of boxers, they want to box. They know the risk. They know what they're getting into. And with mm -hmm. that said, uh, with Demora Smith, here's a question I have. If you want to go about player safety and their well-being outside of football, if you agree to that 17th game after 10 years of saying that football is too rough of a game, if you agree to that extra week of pounding, what type of medical – benefits did you negotiate on behalf of your union forget the cte issue i know of a lot of players because they, they say it on social media and i've actually met a few that have numerous surgeries that have nothing to do with neurological issues for years knees back all that type of stuff mm -hmm. just from the usual pounding and they say you know after about four or five years my benefits run out so that's a lot of lip service that the more smith can say i care about the overall safety and well-being of my constituents. But if you are not negotiating lifetime medical benefits and things of that nature, it comes off as very, very hollow. But here's the other so, issue going to what? Yeah, go ahead, TJ. Yeah, well, I, I can speak to that, actually, because I was uh, I still get all the emails involved in the uh, what the NFLPA is trying to get from people. And so they actually pushed pretty hard. They got dental for, I, I still just having a year on a roster, I get dental insurance. And so they've tried some things. Last year, in, or last time they went, had their go around in the negotiations, that was the number one sticking point, we went lifetime healthcare. They couldn't even get a health uh, insurance company to give them a bid. They said it's too much, don't mm. even try. Mm. So they actually went down this road, not to, not to defend the NFLPA, who I hate, uh, but I'm just telling you, they, that was their sticking point, and mm. they couldn't even get a bid from a company. They said, we're not doing it. And so I, I think a lot of the things that they want that they're being denied is because I don't think Dee Marie Smith is authentically negotiating mm. on their behalf. And it's like this whole adversarial relationship gimmick that everyone and the NFL owners are racist and I'm the black guy taking on these racist NFL owners. Gene Upshaw already blew that up. It's a partnership. And that, that's part of my argument where I disagree with Steve 
is because the players and ownerships, although there's not equality, there is a partnership. They're junior partners in this game of football. And so the junior partners are being led down a path of safety, 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 and let's take a dump on the NFL and call everybody racist. This smearing and kill, they're not being good partners. And if they went and negotiated in partnership, and I'm not talking about just playing nice and rolling over, yeah. but, but these are partners, we're all getting rich, you're billionaires, we wanna be as close to billionaires as we can be, let's figure out how to do this and where we can make as much money, put a high quality product on the field, and make as much money in a shorter period of time as we can for these players. I think you can start, if you're, that's your mindset, you can start winning some of these things in the negotiation, but because, and again, part of this has to do with, they spent 10, 15 years brutalizing Gene Upshaw's reputation, calling him every name in the book mm. for things that, because it used to be, well, Gene, he, Gene won't get him guaranteed contracts. He's, he's a house Negro. He's under their thumb. 13 years, D. Marie Smith has been the head of the, execu the executive director. Show me anywhere where people are complaining about his inability to get guaranteed contracts. Mm -hmm. The whole topic mm -hmm. went away because Gene, they didn't need it to beat up Gene Upshaw. And it was irrelevant when they were talking about Gene Upshaw because the signing bonuses and all that stuff had started under Gene Upshaw. And we love to complain, oh, no guarantee. Yes, there are guarantees in the contract. When they hand you 25, 30 million up right. front, that's a guarantee. Yeah. Now, is all of your contract? No, because in this game, there's so much inherent risk. We can't do that. We'd have too many guys lay down and be like, well, and you know, I'm injured, I can't play, give me the rest of my money. It's not a possibility in football, but a high percentage of the money now is guaranteed. Yeah. Uh, particularly for the for the biggest stars that actually draw ratings, the, the the other thing that I find fascinating about this, and 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 I really want to all of you, but Steve and in, in particular because we're journalists, love to talk about legacy, and you know how we see a player. The whole integrity of the game is at stake, mm -hmm. in my view, and and Tom Brady's. Because I'm going to start making this argument publicly. Hey, man, you can't put Tom Brady on the same pedestal as these guys who played real football. And I think Tom Brady knows it. That's why he trashes the game publicly and says it's bad football. And Troy Aikman just let it slip last night that he knows it. That he's uh. looking at guys, put up numbers and stats, and everybody's better than Troy Aikman, and he's like, Man, are you kidding me? If these guys played in my era, their numbers would look just like mine. That's why I'm, the integrity of the game. You can't put these guys in the same category as Ray Lewis and the other guys that played in a far more physical and taxing NFL than the people that, and particularly these wide receivers and the numbers they're putting up when they can walk <clears throat> across the middle with no fear. Are you kidding me? The degree of difficulty has been reduced in this game to the point that I can put an asterisk next to all of these guys playing right now. Steve, Jason, your reaction to that? I don't know that. about you, but when Troy Aikman had that dress line that he stole from Jack Lambert, I, I gave him a slow 80s clap. I, I mean, wow. <laughs> I, I mean, we must protect Troy Aikman at all costs like we're Nate Newton and Eric Williams. Here's the issue, um, and it was so funny, the reaction on Twitter, a couple of guys saying, I can't believe the misogyny. My wife and my daughter are the toughest people I know. They might be, but they can't play football. Let them try, see what happens. It still takes a special breed of human being, even now, to play that game at a high level, Division One or National Football League. But with that said, this is what Troy Aikman is. He's that 75, 80-year-old guy that worked at the steel mill or the graveyard shift at the factory that probably got paid a decent wage at best. A good night out for him was probably pounding a couple of natty lights at the bar every Friday night in a steel mill town, right, or the Rust Belt. 
And every five years, they could probably save up for cheap seats at Three River Stadium to watch the old Steelers. And he looks at today's generation that gets to work from home, that needs mental health breaks, right? And they get a month full of vacations <laughs> and benefits he could only dream of. And he's thinking, good Lord, really? We're not the same. And, and there's no doubt about it. I remember Troy Aikman. I literally saw every snap he took at UCLA in 1987 and 88, okay? Okay. And I have a great proclivity for him. I think he's one of the best pure natural passers I ever saw. But you know what he was, guys? He was the toughest son of a gun I ever saw in the pocket, him and Phil Sims. There's this particular play in 1989, his rookie year. He's, he it was playing the Cardinals when they were still at that Arizona State sta uh, Stadium. Freddie Joe Nunn hit him like a rocket ship, 280 pounds. I mean, right into the head and the chest. And he threw a deep crossing route for what I thought was going to be the game-winning touchdown with a minute and a half to go. Troy Aikman was laid out for five minutes. I mean, it was one of the most vicious things I ever saw, and he stared right down the barrel of a gun. Nowadays, that would be assault and battery and maybe attempted murder. And then if you go back... The 1993 NFC Championship game, he ducks down. He runs into the knee of Dennis Brown. He was knocked out. Bernie Kosar had to finish that game. Plays in the Super Bowl, I think, a week or two later. And Troy Aikman says to this day, I don't even remember really the NFC Championship game. I don't even remember the Super Bowl. And then his career was ended by the final concussion with LeVar Arrington. Mm. So I think he looks at this game as being very soft. He respects these players, but I don't think he respects what it's become, this particular game of football. So I understand where Troy Aikman is coming from. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a further softening of men. And you, and you can't, we're doing this to our military, we're now doing it with football, and it's like, you can't reach whatever your maximum capacity would be if everybody's coddling you all the time. I was a... Borderline athlete, six foot tall, 200 pounds. Uh, I think it was 183 when I went to college. Probably didn't have a lot of business being on a Division One field. But I was willing to go across the middle and get my head knocked off over and over and over again to where it was like, if we need seven yards, just throw it to that kid. And he may be laying there on the ground concussed for a while, but we'll get those seven yards. And it was, and it gave me an opportunity to bring something different. Today, and, and Tom Brady talks a lot about this. We played a video back about last year sometime where he's like, you don't have to read a defense. You don't even have to lead people out of trouble. Just throw the ball somewhere in between them and you can guarantee a targeting penalty and you'll get your 15 yards doing it that way. And so <clears throat> my, my issue, and this is why I agree with what you're saying, Tom Brady's actively fighting against this because he actually came into the league mm -hmm. when Drew Bledsoe got knocked out of a game when you could hit quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. So he had to earn his stripes as a guy that played, it wasn't the Terry Bradshaw league, right? It was a little bit different in the 70s than in 2000, but it was still a tough league right. in year 2000. And that time is gone. And it's not a game, it, high risk, high reward in everything that you do. If you're, if you're running a billion dollar company uh, and you're the CEO, you could go bankrupt and lose everything. That's a, you may make a billion dollars, you may lose everything. That's the high risk, high reward in everything. In football, the high risk is you may have an ACL issue. You may at some point have some back issues. And here's $10 million for your trouble. Do you want in or don't you? Yeah. Delano, we were, you were talking before the show, mm -hmm. maybe not understanding the resentment angle. And I'm wondering if in this conversation, could you understand why perhaps some former players oh, I, I definitely are resentful? I definitely understand why they are, would be resentful. Uh, I, I guess the point that I was trying to make, and I think TJ brought this up, and I, I'll piggyback on it, I think the changes that we see in the NFL are ones that we see throughout the culture and society in general, right? Masculinity is under attack. Everything is getting softer, right? And, and this is not just the NFL. All the leagues have changed in, in one way, shape, or another. The NBA mm -hmm. of 2022 is not the NBA of 1992, right? You, you, it's just it's a totally different league. You can't, you, you know, and, and guys in Jordan's generation say you can't hand check a guy, you can't do this, can't do that, you can't touch a guy. So I get why older players would be resentful. I completely understand that. What's hard for me to understand is, is that these guys don't see what it is that they're doing. But then, I, again, I think what, what you see throughout the society is people who have been um, past the baton use it to basically strike at the foundation of whatever structure they, they should be building. And I said this, um, I think it was yesterday or, or at some point, 
you, you have, and I was talking more so in a, in a social context, right? You, you may have cities, let's say a guy grows up in Philadelphia, he's fifth generation Philly kid. If he's an activist, he may be trying to burn down a building that his grandfather built. And what you see is every institution has people from the inside that are trying to destroy something that the people who came before them built. Um, and, and some of those, the player safety things, I think people are very sympathetic to it. And even as a fan, to me, I'm just like, look, man, that's, I, I was a cowboy. I'm not that sympathetic I'm, to it. Yeah, yeah, I'm but, not. But, but I was a Cowboys fan, and, and it's like, it, I saw how <laughs> Troy would look. Again, we were talking about Luke Keekley, right? Yeah. Keekley is a guy who could have been an all-time great. He had to retire. But I mean, I'm not willing to sacrifice the game for a few individuals who aren't built for it. Agreed. Agreed. We, we agree there. What I'm saying, me as a fan, I at least get the player safety stuff. What I don't get is we need to make the NFL gay. We need to <laughs> make the NFL a global game. Jason, one, one of your best uh, and most insightful commentaries when you were, um, speak for yourself, is you juxtapose the NBA and the NFL and how the NBA wanted to become a global game and the NFL, particularly in, in, in more recent years, and the NFL is a game where you have rivalries between cities. And it, and it made people buy into the game in a way that was different than the NBA, which is sold across the world, particularly now to, to China. You see that in a bunch of different areas. And the league, its, it's insistence on the social justice stuff, and, and they paint ra uh, end racism on the back of the helmets, and they paint Black Lives Matter. Those are the types of things that, to me as a fan, I'm just like, the NFL is, I mean, right now, it has a limited shelf life because Jason. if what the league wants to do is become a vehicle for social justice, even the average fans are eventually going to turn it off. Yeah. Go ahead, TJ. I mean, go ahead, Steve. To piggyback up Delano's point, uh, you're, he's right. All leagues at the professional level, let's say the four major sports, has gotten softer. Let's go back. There's a famous clip. I believe it's the 72 Major League Baseball All-Star Game. And this is an exhibition game. And I'm sure we've all seen the clip. Pete Rose bowls over. I think it was Ray Fossey for the game-winning run. Mm -hmm. I mean, just bowls him over. A game that didn't count. You know, after the Buster Posey injury about eight years ago, you're not even allowed to have home plate collisions anymore. You basically have mm -hmm. to kind of slide out of the way. The catchers cannot block the plate. And so those things are gone. One of my most vivid and most bitter memories as a young Laker fan, 1984 finals. Lakers on the verge of salting the series away. Kurt Rambis goes in for a layup, and all of a sudden, Kevin McHale, I should never forget. He clotheslines Rambis, right? Both benches empty. Did you know, guys, that, you know what they called after all that? All right, everyone, get to the free throw line. Two free throws for you, Rambis. All right, everyone get back. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. I mean, I'm amazed because when they talk about flagrant run, flagrant two, assault and battery, attempted murder, that play was just, okay, guys, get off the floor. All right, free throws. And the Lakers never recovered from that physical force. Also in baseball, I remember growing up, they used to talk about guys like Don Baylor would go out of the way if he was the runner on first and it was a double play. If that second baseman was anywhere near the infield, Baylor was going to mm -hmm. try to take you out. It didn't matter how close he was. <laughs> they didn't give a damn. Nowadays, you slide too hard. It's an issue. Mm -hmm. So all game in hockey, it all started in the mid-80s, I believe. There was a time that nobody wore helmets, and they started to enforce the helmet rules. But there used to be a lot of fights. I mean, bench-clearing brawls. It was great. All these Canadians throwing punches, missing each other, grabbing. You don't even see that anymore. It's not old-time hockey, as I say in slap shot. So in it's hockey, not just you, the you can't even keep your. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, no, go ahead, sorry, DJ, you can't even keep your face open anymore. You got to wear a visor now. They just keep oh, adding yeah. to it, right? Everybody acts like the slippery slope doesn't exist. Name of all, everything Steve just said. Name me a sport that's better today than it was in the 1980s. Now we got more right. skill, but I would way rather see the bad boy Pistons and Jordan try to overcome mm, that than what I'm true. seeing. I love Steph Curry. I don't need to see him shoot any more shots from half court. Right, I right. want him to see. I want to see him go in the lane and get beat up and overcome. The fun is seeing guys overcome, and men have, we're inherently physical, right? Yeah. You need to be the guy who can out toughen, and the guys who can't out tough it don't belong. Yeah. But in these sports today, you do belong. But, you don't need yeah, any toughness. And, 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 and part and, of this, I, I think the overall. 
Well, I was gonna say really quick, Steve, the overall thing is that we no longer live in a, in a society that honors gladiators, mm. right? And you see this even, we, we've talked about like the, the different ads in the US military, right? The ones in China, Russia, I don't, I don't speak either of those languages, but I know what it is that, that they're promoting. <laughs> yeah. And then you get to the ones in, in the United States and it's a, it's a cartoon and it's about a girl who has two moms and she always felt that she wanted to do more with her life. Yeah. And, Part of this is just, again, we, our culture does not honor gladiators. It doesn't honor toughness. It doesn't honor masculinity. It thinks, it thinks the best way for men to be men is to become more like women. And I think you see that play out both in the physical realm in terms of professional sports and even, even in, in, on college campuses. It's, you, you, we, we can't expose you to ideas that may, may trouble you. We have to have safe spaces. We have to have comfort squirrels and coloring books for the 2016 <laughs> election. And all of these things, I think, run together and, and are being pushed by, and I, I love the word you use in the column, people with subversive agendas. Because if masculinity is, is the norm, then we have to subvert that with, with femininity. And I think you see that injected into all of our sports. Steve? Yeah, Delano, it's interesting. I thought about you because when you're talking, this thing did become political football. Let's go back to 2020. As all of this was going on in our world, the upheaval, and there was a stretch, I believe, of about two weeks where people did not realize or know was there going to be a football season. And, and if you remember, mm. uh, people like Max Kellen were saying, oh, the SEC only wants to play football to appease Trump voters. And I'm thinking, okay, you want to make that? That was, a, that was a reach if there ever was one, right? So I thought it was really <laughs> interesting that different parts of the country, did, though, from the SEC, they flat out said, I don't know about y'all, we're playing football, we're SEC. Right. But there were different parts of the country, specifically the West Coast, which was more liberal. And I remember the Pac-12 was not gonna play, and maybe the Big Ten was, until they realized, oh, wait a minute, if the SEC plays football, that's a bad look for all of us. And I love the fact mm -hmm. that two players, Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields said, uh, uh, we're going to go against the media narrative. We're actually football players. We all like football. And it, it was all forced down our throat. And I thought it was really interesting. So that season went on. I saw the exact same journalists when they would see big crowds at Virginia Tech, because that was one of the opening games last year. Mm -hmm. 70,000 people at Lane Stadium, one of the great atmosphere, coming out to the Sandman. Americans enjoying an American experience. There were certain writers saying, Oh, look at this super spreader event. And then you look at their timeline <laughs> during the riots and looting. Uh, they didn't call that yeah. anything. They call it peaceful uh, protest thing. I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. This thing became such a, and I, and I believe that that was an attack on football. That, okay, if we're stuck with football, let's keep chipping away at the very foundation of it. So when people say, oh, we're, 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 we're drawing a comparison that isn't true, if you actually look at the coverage of football going back to 2020, uh, I don't think it's all that far-fetched. I'm upset and critical of football players not defending this game. Mm -hmm. And and that that's – Delano, I'm going to direct this at you and then Steve and TJ chime in. But – NFL, 70, 75% mm -hmm. black players. Mm -hmm. uh, this league, again, creates more black millionaires than any other industry, including the NBA, because there's just more players, uh, certainly more than hip hop. And, and that's what cracks me up, the hip hop angle of this. If anybody says anything negative about hip hop, mm -hmm people's heads explode yep. and they start criticizing and going after your sellout. How dare you question hip hop, hip hop artists will. And I'm like, hip hop, where the leading cause of death for Come rappers on, is murder. You. Yep. Mm -hmm. th th they're getting slaughtered. Mm -hmm. th this industry, th they're young are getting slaughtered. They go to jail. They get ripped off by the music industry and everybody knows it. Everybody, they get ripped off. They sign the worst contracts mm -hmm. of virtually any entertainer. Everybody knows. But you can't say anything about hip hop without the artist defending it to his death and blah, blah, blah. But football, the former players, the current players, nobody has a problem mm -hmm. bad mouthing this game. And 
it, it blows my mind. And, and it, it, I didn't go here in my column uh, because it was just too much. It, it was just too much. But the whole time I was thinking about this yesterday, I just kept, I was like, so we're the people that were over in Africa mm-hmm. that were capturing each other and sell them off to Europeans. Is there something in our wiring mm. that we can't support the things that are actually good for us? Because that, that, I'm watching black players sit on, people that know better or should know better, former players, Dominique Foxworth, we've called him out. But, but I'm like, this dude's gotta be smart enough to know. Taking this big dump on football and and, and all the people that come on to calling the game racist, and, and, and I'm just, they got to know better than this. I know it's good for them instant gratification-wise over social media, but the long haul of this, this justification of the destruction and tearing down of football is going to harm us in the long run. Mm. And I say that as someone that never got a cup of coffee in the NFL, but football put me on a college campus and changed my life. I feel like I owe this sport and I owe it a defense the same way that a rapper defends hip hop. And I'm just sorry, football's been better to us than hip hop. Hmm. What, what, what are we, why, why is this going over our head or we're that, oblivious? That, that is a fascinating point and I'm gonna try to unpack briefly that point sort of in real time, because I, I hadn't thought about it. Actually, as you started to talk, I, st- I, th- I thought where you were going to go is um, th- there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a certain self-destructive element that can be found within parts of our community that is expressed by people who in one breath will say Black Lives Matter as they march past an abortion clinic and say, good job, guys. Right. So there's that juxtaposition with people whose whose logic can't be worked out. And I think one of the reasons they defend hip hop and attack football is because for the for the people who do this, the people for whom race is everything, they're race obsessed. Right. They see hip hop as an attack on the white power structure. After police, there's nobody whiter than police to them. Right. It's after police. Um, d- down with, That's down with the it. man, down with the man, right? <clears throat> Most it, of it's an attack on us, and there's an occasional true attack. On but 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 in, but in terms of lo- look at some of the groups that they um, valorized, particularly from the late '80s and the early '90s, it was N.W.A. and they, that that whole album was no know, one song on the album. But th- what came, what people draw from it, even in in their documentary, is they were attacking the power structure, right? Whereas- If you listen to the album, they're attacking black people, and th- then they got a one F the police song. Correct. Yeah. And, and, and this, is the way, it's, this is the way it always works. Yeah. It's, it's self-destruction on the inside, um, wrapped in, we're, we're attacking the man on the outside. But the NFL, they see as a bastion of the white power structure, which is why somebody like Brian Flores, when he's doing his lawsuit, he's, he's not saying, he's not just alleging that the team tried to pressure him to do things against his ethics and values. He is saying, he's saying the NFL is run like a slave plantation. He's drawn on a history there for a particular reason. And, and clearly he, he wants to topple what he sees as that, um, that white power structure. Now he's doing it with two white lawyers. And again, he's, he's free to love who he wants. Right. But I think that's the difference between those two things. But I but I do agree there there is an element. And and this is why you get people who are not particularly bright, because they're I I think there's an inverse relationship between, um, you know, a person's intelligence and their ability to sort of read a script. So if you get really dumb guys, they tend to be very good script readers. And when when the people who are behind this stuff feed these guys these scripts, they'll say, nah. I mean, the NFL is, they just treating us like black bodies and this is a slavery in a plantation. And they don't understand that to your point, they are engaging in some seriously self-destructive behavior. Because for a lot of these guys, if it wasn't for college and it wasn't for the NFL, they forget about being a millionaire. Some of them wouldn't even be thousandaires. 
right? And, and given some of their backgrounds and you play the numbers and you see some of the things that some of them got into even in college and as pros, there's a good chance that a significant number would have been incarcerated by now and, and have not had the ability to create generational wealth that completely changed the trajectory of their, of their, of their family. So I, I, I do think there's something to that. And I think that juxtaposition of the PhD level defenses that hip hop gets and the PhD level attacks that the NFL gets, um, I, think, I think there's something to that. And I think you see a group, a subversive group like Black Lives Matter at the nexus of, of those two industries. Steve or TJ, yeah, if you wanna hop yeah. in, if you wanna pat, go ahead, Steve. I know yeah, you ain't I scared. <laughs> I, I, I do not believe Dominic Foxwoke uh, represents the majority of the thoughts of most players, current or former. Um, let's go back to what I said. In 2020, there'd be no college football if the players themselves did not stand up and say, wait a minute, we want to play football. Our conditions aren't perfect. We'd like extra benefits. Let's work on it. But we came here to play football. Guess what? We actually like the game. Because if you remember, Jason, there's actually like this West Coast Pac-12 Players Union that was threatening to blow up the structure. And you could see what the mainstream media was going to do. They were going to create this storyline and narrative that football players across the country are indentured servants and they're being exploited. And none of them actually want to play until you delve deeper. Most of them wanted to play. And unless there was that guy like a Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields, I don't think we would have had a football that season. That's a group of young men that stood up for the game of football. Now let's take a, the rea a look at the reaction of last night. The fact that you had men like Tony Dungy, who made his living and a very nice living in football, and a legend like Lawrence Taylor and a swath of other former players lamenting mm -hmm. what is going on and complaining about it publicly, I think is a defense of football. And I've told you this before, last point. Every Monday out here at the local station, AM 570, Rodney Pete and Eric Dickerson host a two-hour show wrapping up football for that weekend. They don't like what's going on. And they constantly say stuff like, you know what, we got to bring tackling back. We got to bring training camps back. And guess what? We need to start playing our guys in exhibition games because it's actually safer for them to prepare for the regular season. They don't want to dismantle football. They actually want the football that they made their living in. So I don't really think that there's a, a whole group of players that want to see this league go under. I actually disagree with that because if you read the underlying tone of the reaction of what took place after that Chris Jones hit, many of these players actually want to preserve the sport that they grew up in. I, I was going to say real quick, I, I'm, I wouldn't make the argument that a majority of players want the league to go away because, again, that strikes directly to their self-interest. What I'm saying is a major, many players engage in behavior that they don't see as undermining the, the long-term sustainability of the league. Steve brought up 2020. Um, even going back to 2016, like that, the, Colin, the Colin Kaepernick era really exposed um, the vulnerability that the players have to outside pressure. There was a period of time where every week it was, okay, who's going to kneel? Who's going to stand? Mm -hmm. yeah. Who's going to get called a sellout, right? The, I remember the, the one that's burnt, seared into my memory is LaShawn McCoy, Shady McCoy, who was on the sidelines doing calisthenics, looking like a complete clown. And why? Because these players who hear the whispers, oh, it's the, these guys, th this is just like slavery, right? These are $40 million slaves. So when, when just like... Any man who feels like someone is trying to, to take a hit at his masculinity, his natural reaction is to puff his chest up and say, no, I'm a real man. So when these guys hear, oh, these, these players are basically slaves, they, they do what the owners tell them to do. And here comes Shady, he's doing calisthenics, he's kneeling. He's, he's... These guys could not see that what they were doing was killing their own league. Because eventually, if you keep, just like Jason, when you had that parody video, and the players were telling the, the, the you know, Bubba with the, with the brewski that he's racist and this and the next. Eventually, the fans that pay for these players' salaries are going to tune out because people don't want to be lectured to. Uh, a white coal miner in West Virginia who, who just wants to enjoy a beer and watch the game doesn't want to be told that he's privileged by black guys who make <clears throat> $65 million in a year. And, and so I'm, I'm not saying that the players want to destroy the league. I'm saying that they don't understand that their behavior, particularly as it relates to social justice issues, 
makes the sustainability of the league, it puts it in question. That's what I'm saying. I don't know that they don't know it. I think I and disagree with that. Then they're, they're dumber than I thought. And I think they are dumber than you think. <laughs> dumber than I, than I, than I think the players know it, and they say, worth it. We can do whatever we want. We can oh. kneel, and we're going to make this point. And, and part of it, too, I'm telling you, and this is where there is a parallel here to the hip-hop industry. All the owners are white, mm -hmm. 32 white guys. Mm -hmm. And they will, they will do whatever it takes to harm these people, even if it's harming themselves. Right? The players will do whatever it takes. Players will do owners. whatever it takes to harm the Suicide owners. Bombers. Suicide mm -hmm. bombers. Suicide exactly. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the hip-hop industry, a bunch of white power brokers, mm -hmm. and they're not interested in challenging that. And so there is a dynamic, even though what they're actually doing is harming themselves in the rap industry. At least you got some millionaires going on and whatever. You, There's an extra layer to the white people in the music industry that I talked about on my Twitter feed. I'm leaving off this show for now, right. but uh, eventually we'll get there, but continue. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> general, <laughs> general point is, I think these are kamikaze pilots. I think they're as dumb as they mm. sound. I think everybody is explaining to them, you're killing a league that has made so many of you mm. come from nothing yeah. and go to the penthouse, all of you. And they're saying, doesn't matter, don't tell us what we can and can't do. See, they, they think they're kamikaze pilots, right? But kamikazes, from their, from their cultural perspective, had honor. They're really suicide mm. bombers who think they're going to get 72 virgins. Mm. And, 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 and when the structure falls and they're gone, they wake up and they say, what? We're, we're the virgins. And I say, sorry, guys. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to circle this back to what I said at the beginning about DeMarie Smith and the bad leadership and why they elected a Trojan horse. And, and the media won't tell him, and, and social media certainly won't tell him. But, but his lack of vision, and, and this connects to y'all's comments about, uh, uh, and Steve's comments about, why well, I, I hear these former players uh, defending the league or wanting, and, 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 and what I hear from them is they're like, oh, this gives me an opportunity to talk about why these players are getting things they don't deserve. Again, it's unstated, but, but their whole argument of like, look at this game. They don't have to practice. Mm -hmm. They don't have to tackle. Uh, <laughs> the quarterbacks, you gotta put dresses on them. Uh, everybody's Franco Harris and running out of bounds. And, and, <laughs> and it's like, they're not doing what we had to do to play this game and to get into the Hall of Fame and to have these honorable career so we and, and so I think they're they have a avenue to express their resentment mm -hmm. uh, and dress it up as not being resentment but just observations about where the game is uh, and if they had true leadership if they had elected someone who actually cared about football players and this is, again, the, the smearing of Gene Upshaw and the convincing of the players, don't put no football player in this position. You know, he may actually look out for our best interest. But if DeMarie De Smith had a real vision, if a former player or someone that actually loved football players, he would be telling the current and the former players, guys, I'm telling you, we're making a lot of money right now. We can double this money up and we can get a higher percentage of gross revenue, and we can increase the popularity of this game because our competition is so weak. Mm. The scripted television is horrible and woke and, and no one likes it. If we just lean into these values that Pete Rozell gave us, keep this competition high. I'm Y'all think it's a big deal Patrick Mahomes is making 50 million? I'm telling you, if we follow this plan in five years, Patrick, Mil Patrick Mahomes is going to make $100 million. And we're going to generate so much revenue, and this is where the sell to even the, we're going to generate so much revenue that these former players that laid it on the line whose shoulders we mm. stand on, we're going to generate so much money that we're going to increase our give back to the Eric Dickersons, to right. the older guys. We're actually going to generate enough money that we can take care of them no different than how uh, a, a grown son or daughter reaches back and takes care of his parents, right. his or her parents. We're going to do that for our former players while still making a bunch more money for ourselves 
and, and we're going to, it's going to be an actual fraternity. They love to talk about mm -hmm. it's a football fraternity and ball, but they don't take care of each other. Jason, I look at it. I see it. Every, go Jason, ahead, Steve. There's always been an issue of true solidarity within, I think, almost every union. Because look, you're, you're never going to get hundreds of laborers to actually agree on everything. That's human nature. But I go back to the NFL Players Association. The strike of 1987, I think that lasted about 55 to 60 days. And they ended up bringing in replacement players for a couple of forgettable weeks. The product was awful. But if you recall, the last couple of weeks, players started breaking the picket line. And they started mm. becoming scab players, for lack of a better term. And it, it let you know right then, not everybody is pulling the rope in the same direction. And I've heard of other unions, mm -hmm. but with football, the current players, when they go to a collective bargaining agreement, they think about them. They don't think about the forefathers of the game. They don't talk about the future. Everything's about our free agency rights, our minimum salary, all that other stuff. But they never actually say, well, wait a minute. Those guys 30, 40, 50 years ago that played in leather helmets that are, are doing some really great things but struggling, let's give them something and let's also secure our own future. That's the problem with many employees in general, not just athletes. When you go to these situations where you start going for a CBA, you're thinking about you. I, I don't know if the NFL has ever had true solidarity across the board. No one has true solidarity across the board. There's five people in this room right now, and trust, we all have disparate interests. It takes a leader to get four of the five guys to come with the leader. The fifth guy, or maybe even the, the fourth and fifth guy may never come along, but you wanna build enough momentum with two or three in the room that they have no choice but to follow in behind. And so I'm not looking for perfect unity, I'm looking for leadership. Mm and a vision that people can get behind. And these guys aren't getting a vision. What they're getting from Marie Smith is player safety in a game that can't provide player safety. Mm. If they continue down this path of player safety, player safety, player safety, they're destroying the game. They won't have carrot cake. They'll have some ingredients that fit with coleslaw. Coleslaw doesn't sell like carrot cake can't charge as much for it. People don't demand it the way that, it's a nice little deal. I like coleslaw, but if I had a choice between coleslaw and carrot cake, when, if I'm gonna spend $50 or whatever, I'm gonna spend it on carrot cake, not on coleslaw. And so uh, all I'm saying is they don't have a visionary leader or leadership or a leader that actually could come up with a vision because he loves the game and the players that much that he has that vision. Uh, you know, I've been talking about this issue for a solid seven to 10 years. And I've convinced myself that I'm the ideal person to lead the NFL Players Association. I, I really believe that. And, and, you know, not that I want the job, but I really believe I'm the ideal person because even though these guys drive me crazy, I see myself in them. And so I would actually put an agenda forth that actually served them and try to lead them in a direct. And again, that's what Gene Upshaw did. I'm, there's other guys out there like that, but they've used social media, they use corporate media to convince these guys not to love themselves. Yes. We can't be led by one of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding? We gotta go get this little midget. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, who doesn't like us. We were stuffing him into a locker and pulling his underwear over his head all through high school. That's who our leader is. Someone that is nothing like us. Mm. That's how brainwashed we've been mm -hmm. and how, how foolish we, and then we look up and everybody is on TV dumping on the game that makes you money, that you're dependent on its popularity. And then you, you don't think for a moment, well, what about the 16-year-old kid that's just like me that wanted to buy his mama a new house? Mm -hmm. Let me leave the game in good shape right. so that that young man can do for his mama what I did for mine. I, I've been explaining this to players for, man, y'all wanna talk all this crap smack on TV, on, on football? 
all the stuff you did for your family, yeah. and you mm-hmm. don't respect this game? Yeah. yeah. What, 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 what job were you, oh, I was going to be a doctor, and, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I was going to be a pilot, you know, for <laughs> United Airlines. No, you could play football. Yeah. And again, to, I graduated college with a 2.2. I graduated high school, I think, with a 2.8. I got like a 900-something on the SAT. Football mm-hmm. is what put me in the game in a way that I could actually live and finally figure some things out and actually prioritize. Yeah. I got mature enough. It, it, it. Uh, so, Jason. and here's one thing that, that they won't discuss. Sorry, Steve. The... If given the opportunity, right? Because somebody, I, I don't. You, you seem to believe that football is bulletproof, or you said that a couple of days ago. I don't think they are. I no, think, I think football thinks it's bulletproof. But oh, go ahead. Fair enough. I do think football thinks they're bulletproof. I don't think they actually are. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, if you laid it out, because part of the problem is this: at the same time that the support has become safer, right, and that these guys don't have to go through training camp and don't have to get hit, their earnings have skyrocketed. Mm-hmm. During the same time, mm. it's it's a false reward because yeah. that's not going to last. They printed all this money. Everybody's making more money now, yeah. e- every, but it that's goes not, a lot less. But go ahead. And what I'm yeah. what I'm getting at here is that if you did care about the next generation, who's going to suffer the consequences? Because then you would be making a different deal. Because if you came to any of these guys right now and said, hey, here's what we can do. We can cut training camp in half. We're not going to tackle anymore. We'll cut the preseason. Uh, there's just, we're not going to really let people hit you. But you got to take a 60% pay cut. Are you in? <laughs> Ain't one guy signing up. Mm-hmm. Not a single one. And that's what they're doing to the future generations. Because yeah. they're saying, here's the game we're going to leave for you. And for a little while, it's going to be, you know, there's a, a Dennis Prager said this. It's a great analogy. It's the cut flower analogy where he said, hey, everything, when, when the, the structure is really good, like a flower, and, it, and you have the roots and everything, it's great. The flower looks good. And when you cut it, you can give it to somebody for a couple days. It still looks like a flower. It's really good. But all the basis of what made it amazing is gone, and it's going to die. And that's what these people are doing to football. Yeah. They're cutting out the bottom of it, and they're handing the next generation a flower that looks nice, and they're going to have a nice salary for a little bit. And yeah. it's going to plummet like crazy as soon as people realize, this ain't a good product anymore. I'm yeah. living in a romanticized past. This ain't John Elway. Hmm. That was better than my carrot cake and coleslaw analogy. I like that, TJ. Hmm. Steve, go ahead real quick. I'm, I'm, I'm running out yeah. of time. Your story about what the game – no matter how rough or tough, affords opportunities that otherwise would not be available. It, it reminds me of one of the great lines from a pre-fighter meeting that HBO had was uh, Saquon Barkley's uncle, I believe. It was Iran the Blade Barkley, very good middleweight, best known for beating Thomas Hearns twice. So he's fighting on HBO the day before. They meet with the fighters to get some info. And Jim Lampley asks, well, Iran, what would you be doing without boxing? And Barkley just goes, probably breaking into your home. So God bless boxing. I'm glad, I'm glad that was there for him. <laughs> he was blunt. The blade Lotto, was blunt, you got a final thought before blunt. we go. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think uh, I agree, you know, with what TJ said. And I just, I, I Jason, when, when, I, when I see you and I, and I hear you say you would be the perfect fit for, you know, to be lead the NFLPA, it's not just your love of football. But when I listen to you talk, I hear somebody who respects the people who came before him and the institutions that they built. Because there are very few people who I can think of in the public sphere, particularly in sports, who are more connected to their alma mater than you are. Mm -hmm. So I hear you talk about your family. I hear you talk about the church you grew up in. I hear you talk about your college. And all of these things I hear you say, these things were good to me. Let me reach back and be be good to the people who helped me become who I I am. But in the NFL, um, a lot of guys... You know, guys who want to, to, to carry the banner for the league. I think of guys, one that came to mind while, while, while you guys was talking, I think about somebody like Ray Lewis, who is a, I mean, football guy to the core, right? I mean, he's got some, some of the best sound, you know, being mic'd up, so on and so forth. And when he was alleged to have tried to, to, try to reach out, broker a deal between the Ravens and Colin Kaepernick and see if he can do something, they attack Ray Lewis with with memes of Steven from Django Hmm. to make it seem as if he's some sellout, boot-licking coon who who is not standing on the side of Colin Kaepernick in his quest for racial justice. 
that type of thing is is the type of that type of mindset is what leads to destroying institutions. Because if you can't celebrate a guy like Ray Lewis or a guy like Michael Irvin or, or the guys who really say this game has been good to me, I want to be good to the game, then you're not going to have a game to, to play years down the line. Guys, uh, I spent so much time on this. This is all we got to get to today. Uh, I apologize. Uh, you can email the show. I have an email that now works. Fearlessblazeshow <laughs> at gmail.com. Fearless Blaze Show at gmail.com. Uh, we'll play tomorrow and we'll see you tomorrow. Making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my sister, no relation. We all just want to have freedom. Sitting on the corner, never been alone. I'm breaking my back for freedom. Bless, we are living, get back. We are receiving all this evening. We all want to be free. We want freedom. I just want, I want to be. I just want, I want to be. I just want, I want to be. I just want.